I've picked up a few tools over the last few years, some pretty nice stuff. That's a 20 inch Grizzly planer and an 8 inch Grizzly jointer. We've bought the both of those new at the Grizzly showroom in Bellingham. In the background there, there's a 40, 14 inch Grizzly bandsaw. We got that at a moving sale here in town. Over there is a uh, 10 inch Delta table saw and a uh, three horsepower Grizzly shaper. Bought both of them used. Uh, we've got all this stuff and use it in a hangar that I built for my airplane and uh, it's got room in here to put it, set it, everything up pretty nice when the airplane is out of it in the summertime but when the airplane gets put in here there's not a heck of a lot of room in here for anything else so they get stored most of the year. It's, it's fine most of the time. Uh, it's dry. It's out there out of the rain. Problem here is the amount of moisture that we have in the air so these metal tools, the uh, tables on them, the polished tables and and uh, the bare metal pieces have a tendency to rust. Now these I've kept pretty clean, keep them from rusting pretty good by spraying them with paste wax and keeping them waxed up and stuff. And I take uh, some Scotch-Brite and, and polish them up when we get to use them and then once we start using them they get polished up but then when they sit for a while they have a tendency to rust up again just from the moisture in the air tried several different things to keep them from getting rusty and of course uh, one of the well I just use paste wax on them quite a bit when I'm using them and then uh, when I'm not using them then I'll do something else now some people will swear by WD-40 but as far as I'm concerned it's uh, it's it's okay for loosening up something as a penetration uh, penetrating fluid like liquid wrench or um, PB blaster or Marvel Mystery Oil or some of the other things that you can croil, some of the other things you can find, it's okay for that. Um, this actually works good as a cleaner to clean the other stuff off, but uh, the main ingredient in, in these is, seems to be what I've seen is uh, kerosene or diesel oil, which uh, same thing as uh, uh, paint cleaner, diesel oil, kerosene, paint cleaner, cleaner, all pretty much the same. It has some fish oil in it which is supposed to be sticky it dries when the carrier uh, solvent evaporates off but most everybody's quit using this that I know of as, as a preservative because it winds up washing the real grease and the real preservative off probably okay for short-term use but uh, not for long-term use not any better than liquid ranch really LPS2 kind of the same thing a little bit heavier uh, duty than, than WD-40. It sticks a little bit better. Uh, LPS-3 goes on pretty heavy. It's a, a thicker oil, thicker grease, and it goes on, on heavier, so it actually works a little bit better. One of the things that I've used is this corrosion block. It's a marine corrosion block. We first started using it as it was a product called ACF-50, and it was brought out for corrosion control on airplanes and on displays I've seen an aquarium filled up with this stuff with electronics immersed in it still operating so it has no effect on electronics it, it's uh, like some of these oils will short things out or if they get on contacts they will uh, cause resistance between the contacts and cause them to not make good contact but this stuff doesn't seem to have any effect on it this is quite a bit heavier bodied stuff than the ACF 50 it goes on and, and it's supposed to creep and it's supposed to actually penetrate through the bottom of the rust end up any pits or anything like that to get underneath it. Uh, I don't know whether it works for that or not, but it, it works okay. We used it on boats and on airplanes and stuff. This uh, is pretty much my go-to stuff here. Uh, it, this is CRC, Marine Heavy Duty Corrosion Inhibitor. Uh, it uh, sprays on and it goes on thin uh, and then it dries and it's kind of like uh, Cosmoline. It's a real heavy bodied. Well, it's, uh, LPS3 is similar to that, but this is even better than LPS3 as far as I'm concerned. Um, you can spray multiple layers on it as it dries and it builds up into, uh, it'll actually yellow whatever surface it's on and it gets pretty, pretty hard on there. Uh, it dries. It's not oil at all, it's a sticky finish, so you can't use it to run two parts together or anything like that where you want any lubrication. It's just strictly for corrosion uh, prevention. 
and it works pretty good for that. I spray this over all the bare surfaces, even the painted surfaces, and then uh, when I get ready to use them, when I pull the pieces out, then I take, uh, uh, well, I use WD-40 a little bit, but mainly paint thinner because it's cheaper, and then uh, scrub everything down real good and get it all cleaned off, get all of this uh, uh, Cosmetic Corrosion Inhibitor uh, cleaned off, and then paste wax it before I use any of the surfaces. And that seems to work pretty good for most of the year. Now the real problem comes in the winter time, which is this time of the year, when it gets cold, when it gets down below freezing. There's so much moisture in the air that these steel tools uh, get super cold and the moisture in the air condenses on the surfaces of them as frost and they'll actually grow a thick layer of frost on there which doesn't hurt anything on its own but when it warms up the frost melts and you've got liquid water on everything so even this corrosion inhibitor stuff uh, doesn't keep it from rusting when that uh, when that ice gets on there I think maybe the ice and the water kind of scratches down through this wax base of these things and, and maybe gets penetrates that then gets down to the bare metal. But anyway, it just raises havoc with everything. So my idea here for this year is to build a cover for these and uh, put a little bit of a heat source in them to uh, help keep the moisture level down to keep the uh, condensation from freezing on them. Now in the past, I've used uh, these, the treble light, that's what we call them, a drop light they use in uh, working on cars and stuff like that. You got a hook on them and put a 100 watt light bulb on there and stick it in some place and shine it on what you want to keep from freezing or keep warm and they, they worked okay. Another alternative was one of these clamp-on light fixtures here. If you really wanted to stay warm you could use one of these heat lamps but even a 100 watt light bulb would work fine for for keeping things from freezing. Sometimes you, all you need is just a little extra heat on there if it gets down below freezing to keep an exposed pipe or something like that from freezing or, or to keep something dry. I would take this uh, treble light and stick it in the cowling of the airplane in the winter time and uh, leave it on to help keep the condensation from forming in the engine. Even a 60 watt light bulb works, it helps, but uh, you can't buy those anymore. Of course you had to watch out for getting anything too close to it or getting it too close to uh, anything that was flammable or it could cause a fire and it probably did cause lots of fires but uh, that was uh, part of the law of survival of the fittest. Since you can't get a reliable incandescent light bulb anymore and, and these compact fluorescent bulbs and LEDs really don't put out enough heat to uh, do anything, I, I got these little ceramic heaters and they just have a, a light bulb base in them. I forget what the number of name of that base is, but it's the same one as a regular light bulb and it fits in a regular light socket. And this is ceramic light socket that I got to go with these. Anyway, there's all kinds of different sizes of these that you can get. This happens to be a 50 watt. I've seen 35 watts. Uh, I got 100 watt and a 250 watt. And uh, they actually work pretty good. Uh, again, you wouldn't want to put anything cl flammable close to that or it's uh, liable to catch on fire, catch something on fire. But I originally got different sizes of these to try out in the incubator for eggs. Since the incubator we got used 100 watt light bulbs. Anyway, I got uh, some of these and I got a 150 watt one. We tried it and it get hot. The problem with it is the, the mass of the ceramic around here uh, when the thermostat would kick the heater off, when it bring it up to temperature and the thermostat would kick the heater off in the incubator, there was enough residual heat left in the ceramic on this that it would just keep heating up the incubator and it would overheat it. So I tried a 50 watt and it, it just didn't put out enough heat for that incubator. Might work alright if we had an insulated incubator, but it, it just didn't seem to work. But I did get the idea of using these for control of the moisture in these tools and this equipment. So that's what I'm going to do is build a, a container, a box, an enclosure for these uh, shop tools. Close them in and put one of these little heaters in each one, or at least ceramic heaters in each one of them to keep the moisture off of them so they don't, uh, so they don't get rusty to help keep them dry. This is all kind of a rough plan. 
in my head and I'm kind of building it as I go. Uh, there's nothing formalized about it. First thing I did was uh, gathered up some cardboard and I was going to use cardboard for the enclosures there. I thought some of these big uh, appliance shipping boxes would work good for that. And I went out and got some flitches and these are flitches. These happen to be two yellow cedar flitches and I'm not going to use that, these for that project. I, I'm going to use these for a different project. I got some hemlock block flitches. And what the flitches are, are slab, they're boards that we cut off from the log. When we break down a log into lumber, uh, the first thing you do is uh, take off a slab, which is the round part with all the bark on it and stuff. And I'm kind of parsimonious with my wood when you break your back, picking them out, cutting them down, skidding them, hauling them to town and everything, and then milling them out, even though it's a lot cheaper to go grab a board than it is to go buy one you still want to make use of every little bit you can so what I do is I take the thinnest portion of the slab off that I can the round part that's wasted and then I'll cut one inch flitches off so it'll be flat on one side on two sides but it has wane on both sides we save those up and we cut them down and, and you can use them for boards so that's what I did with the hemlock flitches I dug out so I ripped those all down into one by twos and that's uh, that's where we are so far now I'll start trying to uh, figure out how to put those together I'll probably put the one for the jointer together first because I'll make two sides that are 76 or 78 inches long 40 inches tall and then there'll be one uh, of those that length that uh, will, will be the width of the machine and then I'll make two end panels and uh, so we'll make frameworks for those that to start with and see if we can't get that taken care of I just got the frames for the planer cover glued up and stapled together. I used my half inch crown stapler with uh, inch and inch and a half staples and uh, some what is it Weldwood premium semi or water resistant uh, glue. I laid them out on the floor down there, put a staple in each corner and then measured the diagonals and squared them up and put another uh, staple in each corner and that seems to hold them square pretty good. So anyway, there's the, the uh, framework for the jointer together yesterday, last night, and then I let them sit overnight for the glue to dry. So and then I brought them over and kind of just uh, laid them up where they're going to go. I'm going to take them down and put cardboard on them. I'm going to glue and, and uh, staple with just a hand stapler, uh, uh, staple cardboard to uh, all six of those frames. And there's one of the long sides uh, done for the jointer. Yeah, I got another piece of cardboard down there. I got it all clamped up. I got it glued and clamped with that other long frame, other side frame. I'm gonna let those sit for a couple hours and let the glue set up. It's so darn cold here. I don't know whether it will in a couple hours, but I'll give it a couple hours and let it set and see how it goes. I was th gonna use uh, staples on these to staple the cardboard on, just uh, hand staples, but. Uh, the glue seems to be holding up pretty good. I didn't want to go chase the staple gun uh, down in the cold and the dark. So I've got the panels all made for the jointer and the planer. All I've got to do is uh, put those together, but I've got to make up the uh, bases for the heat lamps first. I've got a box made here almost for the, uh, for the little lathe. And uh, there's a little heat unit in there. So I'll take this unit now and uh, screw it all together, the base of it, and then I've got to make a top. So oh, it's just about done. I just uh, take a few minutes to make the top, but I'll get some screws and screw this all together. So that's how I mounted that heater. I just put it on a little block of wood so it stayed stable and didn't tip over and keep all the plastic and uh, flammable stuff away from it. So that help, should help keep this uh, um, lathe from and the lathe tools from rusting up and see. Okay the cover for the lathe is all together and on. Um, got the sides screwed in together here tight and the top I'm just gonna lay the top on there. Uh, gravity will hold it down just fine and that way I'll be able to get it off there in a hurry if we need to. But uh, there it is. That should uh, keep that nice and protected from the 
frosties. Well, here's the little enclosure. It's not really little, but uh, the enclosure for the jointer. I've got it put together with uh, two screws in each corner. Fits in there pretty nice. And uh, now I'm uh, figuring out what to do with the uh, little heaters, little heat bulbs. This is uh, a little kit for the heaters There's uh, that I got. There's a ceramic uh, socket uh, for them and uh, they come with a, a little cord to plug it in. And this is a little ceramic heater. This one's a 100 watt, uh, 110 volt heater. So, um, these little sockets actually uh, are pretty nice. Uh, I don't remember how much I paid for them, but they weren't very expensive, but uh, of course come from China. But they've got a little bronze or copper, brass, whatever, looks like brass, uh, block in there, terminal block for the uh, wire, and just unscrew it, slide the end of the wire in and then screw it down. So that's, uh, that's actually a pretty nice little uh, hookup for that. And then I've got a little tab to mount it down and uh, so I'm going to wire this up and I think what I'm going to do here we'll see how it goes but I'm going to get a board to mount that on and I've got some uh, rare earth magnets that I think I'm going to uh, mount onto the board and then I can just take these uh, one on each side of that uh, jointer underneath it and and just uh, use the magnet to attach it right to the side of it. These little uh, cords uh, they come stripped back and everything, but they need to be stripped. Uh, this uh, outer covering needs to be stripped back just a little bit more. So I'm going to strip that look back a little bit more and then start making up a couple of those. I've got two of these uh, receptacles wired up, and they're actually uh, better than I thought they were. Those little terminal blocks um, are actually drilled down on the lower side of that uh, through the terminal block so that when you tighten that screw down, it actually forces the wire down in the hole on the other side and makes a pretty secure attachment for it. So um, these uh, for Chinese made stuff and being cheap these are actually pretty nice. The, the mounting here looks like it's a little flimsy but that piece of uh, metal there for the mounting is actually fairly stiff. Um, it's not a cheap piece of aluminum so uh, the one I've mounted so far in the lathe, in the box that I made for the lathe, it's, uh, it's holding up pretty good. I get these uh, piece of three quarter inch plywood, cut them down to, to uh, seven inches by three inches, and uh, then I've got these uh, little uh, neodymium magnets that I got, have had hanging around here. I bought just for this kind of purpose, and these are a little less than an inch and a quarter in diameter on the circle, and they're thin ones, they're only like an eighth of an inch thick or so. I took a Forzner bit and I just drilled just a little bit into each one of these. I wanted them to stick proud just a little bit so they make good contact with, uh, with the sheet metal. And uh, and I fastened them down with a, and these were countersunk, these were drilled and uh, with a countersunk hole. So I just took a flathead half inch uh, wood screw and screwed them down. And I used just a little bit of just regular carpenter's glue to fill in the hole because the Forzner bit that I used was inch and a quarter and it's just a little bit bigger diameter than, than these uh, magnets are. And then this uh, one piece had a, a big void in it. This one, this one had a big void in it right where I made the, the um, drilled the hole. So I just filled that up with uh, carpenter's glue. And uh, I don't expect that to hold the magnets in but it does fill a hole up and makes it a tighter uh, fit in there. Now I'm going to take some of these half inch uh, number eight lath screws and screw these uh, sockets down to the other side of this uh, piece of metal or piece of wood um, and uh, then we'll use those to mount these heaters on. Um, so I'll go ahead and do that now. Well, here's the completed uh, lamp uh, heat heaters heat lamps, heaters, whatever you want to call them. And uh, I just uh, set them up on this uh, sheet metal on this drum sander here just to test them out before I took them over there. And they're going to hold on pretty good. Um, I, I left these long underneath with the idea that 
that would, you know, gravity would uh, push down on that and help hold it against there to keep it from tipping off of there the longer that leg was. But that magnet is plenty strong enough. It's, uh, that thing's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. So here's my jointer in the box and you can see how it's already gotten moisture on there and some rust on there just from the uh, frost, just from the ambient air. It, it wasn't exposed to any rain or anything, it's just from the frost. So this should help that quite a bit. Um, down in here is the, uh, the heater. Now uh, that fit right on there, right above that dust collector, and uh, that uh, snaps right on there, and that uh, fits fits real good, and it's nice and tight. I run the cord up down below it, so it stay down below it, and then I'll uh, route it around over here, and bring both cords out together. Here's the other one, and it's mounted on that wall might move it over a little bit farther away from that uh, starter switch, uh, the electrical switch. That's probably a good idea to do that. Just move it over just a little bit there. And that gives plenty of clearance past that plastic box and that electrical switch. And uh, that sticks out underneath this, uh, this uh, table on this side. And the other one sticks out of the table on the other side. So that should give me a pretty good uh, pattern of heat in here. Uh, it's not supposed to keep this warm or anything, but it'll help keep the moisture from condensing on that. Now the box for the jointer is all together. It's all closed in and sealed up. You to get the uh, extension cord to run over there to plug that in. The heater's in on it. And uh, that thing should be safe from the frost from now on, hopefully.